Well, good morning or good afternoon. Morning. morning. Love it. I've been in sales over 25 years. I'm a lifer. I'm like one of those guys at Home Depot that has the weight belt on that helps the contractors load concrete. I'm one of those guys. I started my sales career when I was still in high school selling radio spots in Portales, New Mexico. If I had an analogy for what it was like to sell in 1978, if I were to compare it to a video game, it would be like Pong. You know, just take your time, make the knocks, make the pitches, ask for the order, and then do it again. It's just hand-eye coordination and a fistful of quarters, or maybe you get the console for Christmas. That was the secret to sales success. Activity management was a winner, but things changed. I moved into television advertising, into enterprise solutions, and I learned something. Today, it is an incredibly complicated process for a buyer to get anything done. This is the complicated mess your prospects live in as they try to get their companies to change the way they do business. When I go into companies as a consultant and they worry about their pipeline, we audit the pipeline and then with their permission, much to the horror of certain salespeople, I go talk to the prospects. And I find out what really happened. The salespeople, especially the leaders, think that, of course, they went with the competitor or they chose it at a cheaper price. That's the romantic notion. But over three times out of four, when there's a chronic problem in pipeline, the prospect just went back to what they had and they knew it didn't work. You see, I don't believe there's necessarily a seller's journey. There's a disruption of the status quo that occurs. But it's difficult for that decision, that person we think is the decision maker, that one person we're selling to, it's difficult for him to get everybody to sign off so that there's no political risk so he can make a decision to change. I believe today there's so much complication in our selling process because of multiple decision makers, you know CEB's 5.4 problem that IDC would say is now an 8.2 problem, but there's an increasing technical nature of what we're selling. It's like you need a weight belt to go through the learning curve as a prospect of what these products and services do. That's why I think it's almost a miracle when we move a company off the status quo and they change the way they do business. And that's why I tell people all the time, your biggest competitor is the status quo, but we've got to solve those complexities quick. Because in my experience, speed is everything. So if the going is tough out there for the buyer, that means it's tough for you. And if things are very difficult to close deals, the secret then is innovation. Because when the going gets tough, really strong sales professionals innovate, and they innovate at the opportunity level. Because innovation that comes out of central resources, like some new sales pitch that comes out of sales enablement or comes from the CRO, it has a very short life cycle. Because the prospects heard it all before. They're down the road on the journey already. So we need to be more nimble in the field. I love to talk about the, 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 the definition of words, where words come from. I'm kind of like Sheldon when it comes to etymology. But when you look at the word innovation, what does that mean? It doesn't mean just being creative. When I say people need to be more innovative, what I mean is innovation is when the solution makes its way to market. That's innovation. Everything else is happy talk. So the secret to sales success today in enterprise especially is rapid problem solving. Because when you think of trying to win a complex deal, it's like trying to make the movie Toy Story. It's not just one idea for a movie about a boy and his toys. If you talk to Ed Catmull at Pixar, he would say Toy Story was a really troublesome idea that finally got to market after we solved a thousand problems, and that's the secret to your success too. So the question then is, how do we increase the speed at which we solve problems? And I want to underscore this, speed is so critical to success. When we went back and talked to these prospects who went back to the status quo after quitting the sales process, do you know what happened to most of them? A little alarm clock kind of goes off in their head that goes, wow, I've been working on this deal for six months and nothing's happening, I'm going to go back to work. So every single day we have in the sales cycle where we can't solve some problem, getting in the front door, defining the win-win opportunity, convincing them that they need to change and that we are the unique provider. Every day that goes by is another day that prospect's company can be acquired, changing everything. Your champion leaves the company, changing everything. Another competitor comes in and offers it free, changes everything. Here's my first takeaway. Sales genius is a team sport. 
There is a myth of creativity. There's actually a book called The Myths of Creativity. But there's a myth of creativity that holds us back from collaboration, and it's the idea of the lone inventor. There is no such thing as a lone inventor. It's a very romantic notion in history that one person, all by him or herself, came up with an idea, finished it on them, or their own, and changed the world. In fact, if you look at all the inventors in history, they always worked as teams. Thomas Edison stands for an old man that signed 10,000 pieces of paper and about 40 scientists and 100 assistants working in Edison Studios over the course of time. In fact, we screw in a light bulb today because a janitorial assistant saw one of the engineers that works for Edison putting a turpentine can back on after he washed his hands. And the assistant brought the idea the next time they had a meeting over the light bulb falls out of the fixture problem which had been nagging them for years. He has an idea and Thomas Edison to his credit defends the janitor when people say you're a janitor get back to work by saying ideas can come from anywhere. Let me bring this to sales in terms of how genius drives performance. MHI Global did research two years ago where they identified this, this thing they called the world-class selling organization. The world-class sales organization, you can measure them because they beat their competitors by an average of 20% across key metrics like market penetration and key verticals, closing ratio quality deals, average revenue per account. These are the metrics, not the vanity metrics. These are the metrics that determine the health of a business. And when they looked at the world-class sales organization and they compared it to the rest of the world, guess what? It wasn't product quality that made the difference between the two. It wasn't customization. In fact, it wasn't even leadership bent strength. What they all had in common is the conscious habit of collaboration, especially between sales and marketing and finance around pricing and rev recognition and the delivery teams that live with the deal. When they played ball, they had a dramatic lift in everything, a lift in closing deals faster, a lift in delivering better, a lift in renewals, a lift in opportunity in the market. And they proved this idea that when we bring together the different groups across disciplines, things change. That's why it's so critical for us to immediately ask ourselves, how well does our team play outside of sales to solve sales challenges of all types, especially at the account level? In preparation for today, my company, Deeper Media, did research, about four months of it. We went out and talked to almost 200 companies in enterprise, and what we asked them is a couple of questions. One of the first questions we asked is, would you say that sales and marketing is a partner model with joint responsibilities, or is it a provider model, where sales is the internal customer and marketing provides a service? Some of you will call it an SLA culture. The partnership we determine not based on what sales tells us or what marketing tells us, because they're always going to say, yeah, we get along great. We go talk to the C-suite. We talk to the COO. We talk to the CFO. We talk to the CEO. And not surprisingly, it's like Pareto, right? 80-20. 80% of all enterprise companies, they're just a provider model. Marketing now is on board, provide collateral. They generate leads. They do some positioning work. They work for us, they say. Only 18%, or sorry, 19% had a partnership model. But when they did, the results were astounding across a couple of key metrics. For example, high quality deals. High quality deals would be considered mid to large accounts, high profit, high margin services, you know, the kind that CROs salivate over. And when you take a look at the closing ratio of high quality deals, you'll see that the partner organizations increase the closing ratio by more than 2x. And in my experience working on deal storming and consulting with companies over 15 years, I see that every day in the field. But here was another finding that was even more interesting, speed. So when there is a close partnership between marketing and sales, and let me define that because obviously that word means a lot of things. I mean joint responsibilities, a cultural habit of looking out after each other, a strong history of volunteering for each other's projects as opposed to one-way volunteering. When they had that type of behavior, they brought more innovation to work, they worked quicker on reducing all the latency in deals, and they carved 60 days out of the sales cycle. And for those of you that have lost a deal in the last week or the last month, you know what a dramatic difference it means when we bring together sales and marketing. 
But let me stop and talk for a second about how these partnerships actually occurred, because this was, I think, the most interesting finding of the summer research. So when we went back to the 19% and we said, help us understand what created those joint responsibilities, that interdependent set of relationships where marketing felt like they couldn't succeed without sales and vice versa, only 15% of the time it was structural. In other words, based on mutual compensation where they both had to work together to make their money or a reporting structure where the sales and marketing chiefs reported to a common person like the COO or CFO. That's only 15% of the time. Almost 30% of the time, it was technology platforms that glued them together at the conversational level and caused them to collaborate literally almost more automatically across everything. That was about 30%, twice as likely as structural. And the rest of it, over 50%, was straight up culture. A sales leader extended the olive branch, participated in a marketing program, they reciprocated or vice versa, and they started to work together, and they developed some winning case studies that changed the culture of the organization. Because culture, it's a word that we throw around a lot, but culture is a conversation. It's a conversation about how we do things here. And the conversation is created and becomes habits in the culture based on stories. Those big win-loss stories those iconic fail stories, and to some extent rituals. So when sales and marketing work together to work on the big quality deals, and then sales develops this habit of helping marketing on their projects, all the performance goes up. Let me give you like some brain science behind this to try to explain why you close more deals or close them faster. In our research, we found this thing called the power of four. And as I explain this to you, I want to quote Steve Jobs when Steve Jobs was once asked about the perfect model for business. Like, like, what's the perfect model to create a really innovative, long-standing business? He said, not surprisingly, the Beatles. He didn't say Bob Dylan. He said the Beatles. Here's four guys who can barely stand each other, but they're so different, but at the same time the same, they complete each other. And we found in the research when it comes to solving sales problems, and I'm saying these are challenges at the deal level, you can dramatically increase performance by going wider. So for example, when you add a second perspective to a sales challenge besides sales, think sales and marketing, you increase your chance of solving that account problem by 50%. And by the way, this isn't just closing deals, this is about saving accounts that have fired you or left for competitors. It works just the same. When you bring in a third perspective, think of it as a sales and marketing and delivery, you increase your chance by 100% that you solve the problem. But what we found in the research is the tipping point, if you will, is four. When you have four unique perspectives in the room, that's four separate sets of constraints combined with four separate sets of best practices, and they often clash and do not overlap, you have a cauldron of creativity, and you increase by 300% your chance of solving that problem in that meeting and moving forward. And by the way, as you add more personalities to the room, like five and six and seven, it drops all the way down to zero because it becomes a goat rodeo, you know, at some point, because you can't manage all those different agendas. So let me talk a little bit about what this all means to you. You need to get paranoid as a sales leader that your team isn't playing one company. There's this dramatic, to use a Jobsian phrase, there's a dramatic, a reality distortion field about whether your team plays like a team. And I kind of noticed this as I would get ready to speak at a sales conference, I asked the CRO. Do you think your salespeople participate in one company, which is a big initiative in a lot of organizations? They're always like, oh yeah, we're playing teamwork all the time. So we did research. So we would go find people that had left that company. We'd find them wherever, glass door, and we'd create segments so there'd be the disgruntled person that left. And then there's a person that left because she got poached to a better opportunity. And we both asked them the same questions. Do you think you play together as a team? And guess what we found out? It didn't matter if they were disgruntled or happy. The boss is wrong 90% of the time. They don't play like a team. They have their own separate way of doing things. The lone wolf knows how to collaborate. It's just a question of timing. The lone wolf seller waits until the very last second and goes and grabs an expert to solve their problem, and they use it with blunt force. It's like, you are going to help me. We're gonna have an engineering call and close this deal. Folks, that's not collaboration. Collaboration is when you bring them in early in the sales challenge, and here's the takeaway. 
The best way to promote collaboration is when you have a sales challenge, ask who has a stake in the outcome? And that's how you build your team. You may ask at the very last minute who's an expert about why I'm stuck, but what you will find is almost half the time once you bring the right team in the room, you are trying to solve the wrong problem. The root cause of the problem must be solved for innovation to occur, and you get it by going a little bit wider as opposed to being taller inside the sales silo. So there's a huge overconfidence for sales leaders on promoting cross-department teamwork. I think a lot of CROs, they're as confident about their teamwork as they are the scientific nature of the metrics and with the quotas they give to their people, which are all made up. I'm sure you know this now. Every quota is made up. Every metric is all made up. They think they promote one company behavior like Corey Feldman thinks he can dance. We've got to get more paranoid that our teams aren't really playing like teams. And it's really a question of creating a culture where working outside of your group with those that have a stake in the deal is the first response when you get stuck and not the last resort when you think the deal is going to die. And I think that's the change point here. Let me talk about what it means to recruiting. So if the lone wolf, and there's a lot of research that says this, if the lone wolf is getting stuck, if the lone wolf is actually slower, if the lone wolf, like some of the sales trainers I see on YouTube, if they really think there's one person that they can close by being unreasonable, you notice that they have a huge drop off rate in their pipeline. If that's true, then who do we hire? We hire quarterbacks. So here's a trick question for the interview that I've seen some enterprise companies use to find the right kind of salespeople that have a natural tendency to play like a team. Question, candidate question. Tell me about, in your last job, a project you volunteered for outside of sales, in marketing, like voice of the customer research. Tell me about something you volunteered for outside of sales. Tell me why you did it, what the motivation was, and most importantly, how did it turn out? What was your ROI for your time? The right answer is any answer. You see, partnerships between sales and marketing, between sales and service and operation, they're fed by the favor economy. People doing favors for each other. People participating in each other's, not just us grabbing someone from marketing to fix our problems. If they look at you and say, I've never volunteered for a project like that, I was heads down killing my number, you should be very worried about that person's tendency to work with the land of slow or go talk to the world of no before they actually are working on a deal. I wrote this book called Deal Storming, and um, for those of you uh, that are interested in a copy, just pick up a card in the back and we'll mail you one. Deal Storming is a process I've developed, and it started all the way back when I was working for Mark Cuban at Broadcast.com back in 1997, but it's like brainstorming for sales challenges. It's about building a team that, as you know now, has multiple perspectives, creating a team that's focused on a specific account, saving a deal winning a new piece of business, and it follows a very simple seven-step process. You qualify to make sure it's strategic and difficult enough to warrant bringing together multiple personalities. You don't ask people to come to a meeting, you organize around a movement, a big why that's bigger than the revenue. The two things I want to point out here is that the key to collaboration when you bring someone into your sales challenge is preparation. If you want to invite people from out of sales to join your team and work with you, give them a deal brief at least two days before they come to the first meeting and be transparent and be honest with them about what's the real opportunity. What do we think the sticking point is? What does the stakeholder map look like, the best we can tell? What have we done to date and is there any other information about market changes that would give us food for thought? If you create that deal brief, it changes the conversation two days later because people come into the room with incubation time to have ideas that can be connected with each other and then you can have friendly debate. The other thing I want to point out about the process is the importance of running strong meetings. No matter where you are in your career, your ability to lead magic meetings defines your ability to be a good leader. I've met a lot of CEOs of big companies who've gone on to become very famous authors and consultants, and when you sit in the room and watch them lead, it's always about the cadence of how they lead meetings. When I think about the perfect solutions meeting where you've brought together the right team, you're gonna solve a really difficult sales challenge and move, it looks just like this. 
You've briefed everybody. So you open the discussion to a debate about what's the real problem and you let people beat up your assumption about root cause. Then you open up the floor to potential solutions. All you want to know is what is the action, why do you think it's going to work, and what's the key assumption behind it? That's all you do. You don't debate it yet. Then you begin to narrow. And whenever possible, as a person who's running the meeting, and I like to see account execs run these meetings, it's a great way for them to organize research resources, Look to combine ideas together. Because in my experience, when I see ideas that were breakthrough ideas in convincing the client, or breakthrough ideas in determining the win-win deal, they always came from two ideas that were like, eh, got put together and improved into something that really worked. And then it's all about closing. Because as a salesperson, you've got to close everyone in the room. You've got to practice consensus to drive consensus outside. And what you're not trying to do is get everybody to love it. You're just trying to get everyone in the room to live with the next play. So even if engineering is a little itchy that the customization you are suggesting might create workload, if they can live with it, that is good enough to close. But the focus of the meeting is this, next play. Because if you want to see a team break up, just have a two hour meeting where the conclusion is, I'm going to go off and think about it, and we're going to have another meeting. That is not how you keep a team together at work. You keep a team together at work by figuring out one thing you can do that's going to move you one step closer. You're not trying to throw a Hail Mary and close the deal. You're just focused, as Coach K would say at Duke, on the next play. And as we think about innovation, I just want to talk about two things in closing. I want to talk about sales innovation. So when a person is stuck in a sales challenge, there's three hats they can put on to move forward. If you're stuck getting in the front door, you might put on the hacker hat. That's what social selling is all about. Social selling is a hack, and I mean that in the most positive, complimentary way. It's a different route taken that is unexpected. Social selling will work as it's working now until what? Until the prospect knows that people are sharing and liking their content as a way of prospecting. There'll be a saturation point when it won't be unexpected anymore, and then there's going to be a new hack after social selling, and that's one hat to put on. Then there's the chef hat. Customer doesn't want to buy a product, they want to buy what? A solution. And they're getting very fed up with being sold individual items. And many of the companies I talk to, their customers are looking for a single invoice, a single solution. That's becoming more important than price. It's becoming part of the price discussion. So when I think of really effective salespeople today, they have the chef mentality. Um, I tell the story in the new book, Deal Storming, about Alyssa D'Amatos, one of the greatest salespeople in the history of the career builder culture, and she was as curious as Columbo about everything career builder did. She wanted to know about all the products, not just the job placement products, she wanted to know more about the media products and how targeting really worked inside the company and what the enterprise network looked like and what is this thing called the talent network they were building. Her boss, Sarah Gilpin, told me that she met and talked to over 50 people and was precocious in asking questions. And that's how she figured out putting together the biggest deal in the company's history, because she understood if you combine the right parts at the right place, you create something that single product competitors can't. Finally, there's the idea of the artist. Prudential Retirement's corporate group that goes out and sells record keeping services, um, they have a really strong partnership between their sales and marketing organizations. It's driven partially by platform and partially by internal culture, but they have this, this improv habit called yes and. So when they put together a team because they were trying to increase their finals closing ratio, that's where they go into the benefit committee at a big company that's looking at a 401k record keeper and they have the final presentation. They wanted to increase the closing ratio because it cost them tens of thousands of dollars to get to the finals. They brought everybody together, including sales and marketing and operations and enablement, and they begin to kind of play around. And then one of the people from marketing says, well, how about this commercial we have in the market? If we could roll that video, please. We went out and asked people a simple question. How old is the oldest person you've known? We gave people a sticker and had them show us. We learned a lot of us have known someone who's lived well into their 90s, and that's a great thing. But even though we're living longer, one thing that hasn't changed, the official retirement age. The question is, how do you make sure you have the money you need to enjoy all of these years? So, 
The reason they really went to market with this is because they've learned that when they find a company and a committee who has an emotional reaction to this idea, that creating planning to 90 is something you do because that is your purpose, not something you do to check the compliance box, that customer is twice as profitable to Prudential. So they're looking for people that respond to this. So the marketing guy in the meeting says, why don't we show the commercial? The sales guy says, yes, and why don't we not just show the commercial? Why don't we build one of those dot walls on the actual conference room when we're making the presentation? Then an operations person says, yes, and since seven of us present during finals, what if each one of us, as we got up to make our little five or 10 minute part of the presentation, what if we put a sticker on the dot wall and say, my Annie Lane, the oldest person I know, is 92 years old, to really underscore the idea that the average person in the average company's 401k gets them to exactly 67, okay? And then the magic moment is when an operations person says, yes, and, and what if we convinced every person on the committee when they introduce themselves at the middle of the meeting when we do the introductions after the core presentation, what if they put a dot on the wall and identified the oldest living person they knew? So they tried it, and their closing ratio went through the roof. Because not only did they get more visceral participation in this simple idea, what is the oldest, who is the oldest person you know and are they prepared, they were able to identify the mobilizers sitting across the table by how they responded in the room at the time to their own participation. And this is what I'm talking about, these kind of relationships. Not just do something for me, but the yes and nature of a true relationship where you depend on each other for success. In closing, I tell you something, the best time to build relationships across your company is long before you need them. I went to work at Yahoo in March 2000, just in time for the dot-com crash. When I was looking around in January, the world couldn't be a better place in the Silicon Valley. Yahoo was at about $250 a share, and it was an awesome time to be alive. You know, you know the times. But when I got there in March, things had changed a little bit, right? Because that's the beginning of the dot-com crash, the puncturing of the balloon. The first day I'm at the cafeteria, this is the Santa Clara facility, I walked to the cafeteria and I remember telling my wife later, it looked like a scene out of Clueless meets Mean Girls, okay? I looked at the cafeteria, it was just a bunch of clicks. Sales was sitting with sales. Marketing and content were sitting with by themselves. Engineers were over here with their propeller heads and their dogs. They were all sitting separate. So I made a decision that day never to eat with sales again. And every single day I put my tray down at a different table, said, hi, I'm Tim, I'm the new guy in sales. I came from the acquisition. They beat the crap out of me because I was ruining Yahoo's front page with ads. And I took it and I looked for opportunities to help. I'd find projects I could participate in, things I could volunteer for, presentations I could help them make, networking introductions to the finance or funding groups for them to get more budget, and I tried to create a currency. I called it the favor economy early on. And I built these relationships because I thought we all should talk to each other, because I came from Cuban startup in Dallas, and we were little, and we were scrappy, and we talked to each other, and we knew the guys in the broadcast booth, and I didn't understand why we worked in silos. I was a bit naive. But a few months later, when I had an opportunity to get on the Ford account, and then later the Disney account, which were a crisis for us, I put a team together. And the team was based on the people that I had worked with over the last six months, and they brought everything to the meetings, and we created a core group. We called it the Value Lab. And that's where I learned that the relationships are built proactively and not based on challenges that you have today. I'll leave you with this simple idea. You have the power to create a collaborative culture by your example. When I study companies where sales steps up and says, we're going to bring other people in early when there's a challenge, we're gonna hire people that volunteer outside of our group to expand their horizons, you change the culture, not just of how you sell, you change the culture about how products get built and they start talking to the CRM specialist for the first time and taking notes and reducing service bankruptcy. You create collaboration between finance and marketing which increases marketing full through in terms of budgets. You can change the world one story, one example, and one good hire at a time. If you'd like to read a chapter from the book, just rescan on your way out the door. I also have a DVD if you want one. And please connect with me. I am Sandra Says on social media. It is my pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you.